we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So thought Thomas Jefferson when he penned the Declaration of Independence, our ur or foundational document upon which our present American Republic uh, stands, the Declaration of Independence paving the way for the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Hello everyone, this is Pastor Terry Reese of the Valley Grace Brethren Church of Armal, Pennsylvania. As always, we deem it a very high privilege that you have chosen to spend some of your precious time with us on the broadcast, and we welcome you. We are continuing our studies in this matter of the sanctity of human life. We quoted Jefferson, a man who, though not thoroughly orthodox in his theological opinions down the line, nonetheless was a man who was the byproduct of a colonial America that had came out of the first great awakening and was still glowing. Uh, in terms of its, uh, the effects of, that, uh, of the fire, of that great revival. Jefferson believed in a single great omnipotent God, an omniscient God who was the creator of the world, and unlike uh, deist thought, he believed that this God was an avenger of wrongs, that he punished the wicked, and uh, this indeed is the foundational article of our democratic republic, the fact that we believe, that believe in biblical creationism. All men are created equal. This gets to our point, the, uh, the sanctity of human life that we've been speaking about in the last several messages. This is actually the fifth message along these lines. We invite you to turn into tune in to uh, either YouTube or Internet Archive or Rumble and view the prior messages, which kind of uh, uh, are building one message after another. But uh, this matter of the sanctity of human life. I am a uh, member of the College of Pastors of the Conservative Grace Brethren Churches International. In Article 5 of our Statement of Faith, which is a revision of the, uh, the 1969 Fellowship of Grace Brethren Church's Statement of Faith, reads as follows, We believe in the sanctity of human life. Unquote. And it is very important that that uh, assertion was, was made and inserted into the revised Statement of Faith. We live in a day and age when uh, this, uh, when the... Uh, the sanctity of life is something that is uh, rapidly evaporating in the midst of our culture. Um, we believe that human life is, in terms of the creatures of this planet, distinct, unique, set apart, that it is sanctified and honored by God. In other words, human life is not like animal life. Human beings were created in the image and likeness of God. The, that's the basis of human dignity, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. The Lord says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then it goes on to tell us that he created them, male and female, two genders, not one, not 30, two genders. In an upcoming message, we'll address that topic as well. But the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, examining various ways in which, uh, uh, in which we see in modern times uh, the image of God being ignored in our fellow creatures, uh, the dishonoring and debasement of human life. And we've been looking at some prevailing trends in which we see the Imago Dei uh, being under assault within our present world. You know, friends, this world 
and let's face the truth here, is a world that in the sight of God is utterly radical in its sinfulness. It is a world that is under the judgment of the living God. And it is a world that none of us, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, should be comfortable in living in. Okay, we should not be comfortable here. Uh, ultimately, heaven is our home. That is our nation. Uh, that, is the, that is our future. That is our destiny. 1 John 2.15 reminds us of this. Quote, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Unquote. Friends, it's, uh, it's not good if you're too comfortable down here. Now, continuing uh, our discussion on some of the, wa the ways in which the, this assault on human dignity is generally manifest in today's world, um, last week we spoke of this matter of uh, nonchalance with regard to the rule of law. Uh, we don't, we're not seeing least in the modern Western world, the so-called advanced nations, appropriate proportional punishment of offenders. As we, and as we discussed last time, that is just another reflection of how uh, human dignity is not taken seriously. Again, we invite you to tune in to that message, which we uh, recorded uh, last week. This week, I want to look at a, a second area in which we see the debasement of humanity, uh, our modern culture uh, forgetting that man is created in the image and likeness of God. And this deals with uh, the matter of the sin of favoritism, or is it sometimes referred to the sin of partiality? Partiality. Perhaps you haven't heard much preaching on this, uh, this topic, but uh, you should because the scriptures uh, often uh, very frequently discuss this matter and uh, very frequently inform us that this, when, that this matter is an abomination in the sight of God. The sin of partiality. Well, let's define what that, what that means. Partiality is uh, the idea that uh, the lives of some people are deemed to be intrinsically more valuable than the lives of other people, inherently more valuable, based upon such distinctions as wealth, social class or caste or station, race, Rank, ethnicity, national identity, and gender. Uh, the, again, the idea is that some people are inherently, intrinsically more valuable than others who were likewise created in the image and likeness of God. You know, friends, you look at human history, it has long been tainted by Diverse upheavals, disturbances, abuses, revolutions associated with uh, class and economic distinctions, associated with racial and ethnic distinctions, associated with the hierarchical categorization of human beings. We've seen so many disturbances throughout world history based upon... Uh, the, this whole matter of partiality, people not treating other people as though they indeed they are their inherent equals. So we think about uh, how our society has been categorized, and it seems like we are uh, you know, we are just addicted to the categorization of other human beings. We uh, we see we see the following. Over history, the formation of various aristocracies and elites, whether you're talking about old world style class structures or modern style elites, there is always an elite class 
who somehow is inherently more valuable than others. You see uh, in world history the formation of caste systems. No, most notoriously, of course, India. You know, there's a, a country, yes, I know that the modern India is the world's largest democracy, supposedly, although uh, they certainly do not treat the Christians that live in their, their midst uh, as equal citizens. But um, India, while, it, uh, it's legis while it's a constitutional and legislative structures have, have uh, taken a stand against the caste system, nonetheless, it is widely practiced, and it always will be as long as Hinduism uh, it remains the prevalent faith of that, that nation. In tradition, traditional Indian culture, you have the four major castes subdivided into various subcastes, uh, hundreds of subcastes. Uh, but um, the four basic castes, you know, the idea that the priestly caste, uh, the Brahmin caste is at the top, and then the warrior caste, and then the merchant caste, and uh, uh, then the laborers, the sudras, and then beneath them are the outcasts the untouchables. And uh, the, this is inherently wedded to Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism, of course, believes in the law of karma, that, uh, that bad deeds will cause a person's karmic debt to accumulate, weighing that person down so that uh, when they are born in, the, in terms, terms of their next life, that they will uh, be at a lower station than they were in the previous life. They believe in the transmigration or reincarnation of souls. And if you're a low-born Sudra, it's because you, uh, you did not live the sort of life, perhaps, that you could have lived. That's why you're not a high-born Brahma, Brahmin. Uh, you, are, you are down in the, uh, the lower working class. And of course, if you really lived a bad life and you're really weighed down with karmic debt, you're born into the, uh, you're, you're born as an untouchable, an outcast. Of course, there's a racial element attached to that. The, uh, the so-called uh, outcasts or the untouchables traditionally are darker skinned Indians. But you see how the whole thing is married to the Hindu uh, religious system, to the whole idea of karma and uh, the transmigration of souls. And so it's going to be something that's, as long as Hinduism is the prevailing faith, is pretty much uh, solidified in Indian culture. But um, we've also seen in world history the idea that women are inherently inferior that they are a lower order of being. And we've seen much violence against women and uh, oppression of women uh, throughout the world history. Uh, this is the idea that women are intrinsically and spiritually inferior. They're just a lower order of being. Of course, the Pharisees in Jesus' day suffered from this sort of uh, delusion um, women uh, accorded a very lowly status. Uh, women were not to be taught spiritual things. Some of you may remember the delightful movie from 1983, Yentl, um, wonderful musical starring uh, Barbara Streisand. Despite her politics, one of our greatest, one of the greatest popular singers of this century. Uh, but. Um, the story is based on an Isaac Besheva Singer um, short story, uh, which tells uh, the tale of a uh, young Jewish woman who is the daughter of a learned rabbi. And she uh, has a great hunger to learn the Talmud, but uh, her, her father, uh, a kindly old man, uh, teaches her the Talmud, but when he does so, he always keeps the drapes pulled shut. And when she asks why, his response is, uh, as far as a girl learning the Talmud, a woman being educated in the Talmud, maybe the good Lord understands this, but certainly the neighbors will not. Um, this is why it was so shocking, by the way, the, the story of Mary and Martha, 
or Mary is uh, fussing around the kitchen and she's upset that her sister isn't helping her. And the Lord Jesus tells her, uh, Mary is doing the better thing, sitting here at my feet, learning spiritual truth. Maybe you should be sitting next to her. Um, this was a revolutionary viewpoint, this idea that, yes, women should be taught Christian doctrine and in that sense are uh, spiritually equal to men. They have the same spiritual capacity as men. Of course, you have the, uh, the Islamic faith, which has a, an outstandingly dismal record with regard to the treatment of women. We won't expound much on that, but uh, I think we, you all know what I'm talking about, the abuse of women, the idea that uh, you read in their sacred writings that uh, women are to be whipped and sent to their couches, um, the idea, just the idea that women don't have the property rights as men or the legal rights as, that men do. Women really are seen as a lower order of being, inherently inferior, inferior in all ways. Also, in our, throughout world history, we've seen the blight of racism, which has created so much, uh, so many disturbances throughout history. Uh, you think about the bloodiest war that Americans have ever, have ever thought, fought, the, uh, the American Civil War. And uh, Certainly, I mean, uh, I will acknowledge that the Confederate state had, a, had certain arguments that were valid. Uh, the idea of states' rights is a constitutional uh, issue in which they probably were on the right side. But when it comes to this matter of slavery, definitely they were not on the right side. The idea that African Amer Americans are inherently inferior, um, obviously the Lord's not in that. And But it's throughout history, we've seen various uh, uh, expressions of racism, not just in the United States, the way some people uh, want to paint it today on the progressive left, uh, throughout world history. Of course, in modern times, you had the awful system of apartheid in uh, South Africa. You've seen ethnic discrimination uh, throughout uh, throughout history, the the devaluation of human be beings raced, uh, based upon nothing other than what color their skin is, uh, is or what their national identity is. We've seen in modern times at attempts at ethnic cleansing. You know, you think about uh, not simply the the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews, which was the most notorious example. And of course, they also tried to wipe, wipe out the gypsies, uh, the Romani. But also, you think about the uh, Turkish genocide against the uh, Armenians. Uh, that's, uh, that's one that's kind of forgotten, an attempt, modern attempted genocide. Um, perhaps this was part of the basis uh, of the Nazis' confidence that their horrific atrocities would one day be forgotten because the Turkish atrocities were largely forgotten against the Armenian people. Um, we see, uh, I already mentioned, the formation of aristocracies and elites, uh, but um, you, you see today various new elites over the last uh, century emerging new elite aristocracies, uh, this often based on economic uh, uh, concerns. Uh, a certain class has arisen in the United States and the Western world with the, uh, the rise of industrialism, huge fortunes, uh, the rise of the billionaires, and now the, uh, you see the, uh, the progressive multinational uh, uh, elites of today. The, you see uh, elites based upon education, the educational aristocracies, the idea that you have a progressive, woke, elite class that is inherently better than rural people, than working class people. You have a new aristocracy taking place. Some people are just better. 
you uh, also on the uh, on the other side, uh, you, you uh, not only have you seen traditional racism against minority people and so forth, but uh, you now see kind of a counter racism today being encouraged by the progressive elites. Um, you see this critical race theory, which uh, has put aside Martin Luther King's call for a colorblind society in which people are judged according to their characters, and instead claims that uh, oppressed people, that is, people of color or what, whatever uh, the area of oppression supposedly is, um, that these people are inherently superior, that black people are superior to white people because they are the oppressed class, and uh, white people are the oppressors. See, uh, you have a, a turnabout of these things, and they use this idea of intersectionality to figure out who's the most oppressed, and those people are rank higher. Yeah, this is kind. Of, this is a, this critical race theory comes out of a neo-Marxist school called the Frankfurt School, and uh, that was uh, that was a group, uh, a neo-Marxist group that was operative in the Weimar Republic era in Germany. But uh, it has this idea of uh, of t two different groups, uh, class division. Uh, of course, the older form of Marxism focused on uh, capital versus labor, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. And the idea is that the proletariat essentially is pure and noble, the working class, whereas the bourgeoisie, business owners, they're evil. So you see this, the, this whole idea of cert that certain people are inherently better superior to other people, other people, more valuable than various other classes of people. Now, when we approach this matter of distinctions between men, a certain degree of subtlety is required. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew 22, verse 37, that we're to worship the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let's uh, single out one of those, mind. Sometimes we have to be subtle in our thinking, uh, sophisticated in our thinking. We have to balance various truths. And this is one of those occasions where we're called upon to use our mind. Now, we've already said that, uh, some of the, that uh, um, this idea of debasing other human beings based upon various distinctions is wrong. It's caused many problems in our world. And yet, we should acknowledge that there are recognizable ethnic, gender, economic distinctions. There are distinctions between the ruler and the subject. And that there are these functional differences which uh, the scriptures recognize, and in fact, we see certain uh, scripturally assigned responsibilities uh, associated with these various categories and groupings of people. Uh, what we're saying is the ver these various distinctions are not necessarily bad. It's only bad when we claim that certain people are inherently more valuable based upon these distinctions. Some of these differences and distinctions between human beings are, in fact, part of the natural created order. Think of Genesis 1.27. The Lord says that he created man in his likeness and image, and he goes on to say in verse 27, Male and female, he created he them. Okay, there are two genders. Again, not just not one gender that's fluid, and not 30 or 40 different genders. You know, I've actually seen uh, uh, charts that show a zillion different genders. Um, but the truth is there are only two genders, and the rest of these are either delusion or insanity or just, uh, just out and out depravity. Okay. But um, 
there are these two genders that you note are were created by God. These differences are of divine origin. Now, what uh, what sin has done uh, in terms of some of these uh, some of these uh, the matter of some of these distinctions is it has distorted the relationship between uh, these uh, various uh, this, uh, groups. And it has magnified uh, some of the uh, the differences and uh, uh, caused social disruption. Um, you know, if we think about the the war between the sexes, uh, God created man and woman. That is of divine origin. The differences are real, and they're delightful, and they're wonderful. And uh, man and woman are, were were designed to complement one another. But sin was introduced in Genesis chapter 3, and you see a reference, a subtle reference to the war between the sexes that would begin uh, in Genesis 3.16, uh, how, the, uh, the, uh, how the woman would have uh, you know, certain desires to uh, liberate herself from the man, and the man would be, become a tyrant. Uh, that's kind of subtly... Uh, hinted at in Genesis 3, 16. That's not God's will. The idea that there are two different sexes is God's will, but not that uh, they be at war with one another or abusing one another or dishonoring one another. That's not God's will. We, uh, in recognizing these functional differences between various groups, um, this, uh, this should not be understood these differences should not be understood as intrinsic inferiority. Uh, it should not be understood as an inherent natural inferiority of being or a spiritual inferiority in the sight of God. We might illustrate this through the, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, um, contrasting what's, what theologians call the ontological trinity versus the economic trinity. What we mean by that is, when we speak of the ontological trinity, we're talking about being. Onto ontology deals with being. And what we mean by that is, uh, you, uh, you have the trinity as it is, in relationship to itself. Uh, you have the three divine persons, sharing the one divine essence, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In terms of being, each of the persons of the Holy Trinity are co-equal. There is no inherent inferiority within the Trinity. Um, if you look at some of the, that great early creed of the uh, the Christian church, the Athanasian creed, it really states the matter very well. And uh, the fact is, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And God cannot be inferior to anything. The Son is God. Thus, he is inherently co-equal to the Father. They, are, they both share the same divine essence. There is but one God. And uh, each of these personalities, uh, this, uh, this lower level of subsistence within the Godhead, each of them are co-equal. You can't get any higher than God, and the Son is God. So he is equal in terms of his being and substance to the Father. Um, However, then you have what we call the economic trinity, and that deals with the trinity's relationship to the outside creation. And in particular, when you look at redemption, God saving the world, each of the members of the trinity have adopted varying or differing functions. The son becomes willingly subordinate to the father, and he is the one who is sent. It's not the Father who is sent. It is the Father who does the sending. He sends the Son, and the Son pledges to do the Father's will. 
He always does his Father's will with regard to this uh, ministry of redemption, which again deals with the Trinity's relationship to the outside world. So here you see equality in terms of being, and yet you see a subordination with regard to function. The same is true, we would argue, with, uh, in terms of human beings. All human beings are created equal. They are inherently equal in the sight of God in the sense that they bear the divine image. That is, in terms of creation, men are equal. All are descended from Adam, who was created in the image and likeness of God. And the second way in which uh, men are equal is that all are born of a fallen Adam, all share in the fall. There is not one righteous, no, not one. The scriptures repeat over and over and over again. So we are equal in terms of, while we have the divine image, it is a distorted image. Um, we, uh, we would also observe that... Uh, in terms of unity, men, if they turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, if they turn to him redemptively, they can, no matter what their race, creed, or their race, their color, their, um, their national identity, uh, whether they're male or female, whether they're highborn or lowborn, in terms of uh, the economic structures of this world, that they can be conformed into the image of the Son, which is God's purpose in redeeming us, Romans 8, 29. So uh, all human beings are created equal. They are equal in terms of, having, of being a fallen creation, and they can become equal, they can become one in terms of redemption. Um, and yet... Despite all this unity, still we recognize that there are various differences between human beings, and we're going to underline some of those, various functional differences, various differing assigned roles within creation. There, is, there are various order, uh, the expressions of order and hierarchy with regard to this truth, that there are distinctions and there are legitimate differences between men, but none of that means inferiority. It means that we simply means we have different functions, and we need to find our place within the created order. Let's look at some of these differences. Labor and management. Too often uh, today it's labor versus management, and that should not be. Each has their assigned responsibilities before God, and eat, and you know this is part of the uh, uh, part of the uh, order that uh, the prescribed order that we should see. Um, mass, uh, workers, of course, the term used there is slaves. Most workers in the days of the Roman Empire were, in fact, slaves. It was part of the uh, social structure of that, that day. But we might translate this into modern terms. Laborers, the proletariat, um, they are to uh, do a good job, do an honest day's wage for an honest day's work, and are to recognize the hierarchy within the workplace that there's only one boss, and the laborers are not the bosses. They are the employees. They are the laborers. And they are to labor faithfully for their earthly masters, employers. Um, again, masters would be the ancient terminology, but you get the idea. They are to labor faithfully for those uh, whom they are under for testimony's sake. Indeed, it is to be seen, according to Paul in Ephesians 6, as an expression of their service to Christ. You're serving your, as you serve your earthly master, you are serving Christ. Uh, you are, um, you are re really uh, bringing forth a sound testimony when you, uh, when you do faithful work on, at the workplace. You know, friends, none of us uh, should want to be known as uh, someone who's shirking 
in their work. Um, that's really a form of stealing. And, uh, you know, if a man is giving you a paycheck, you owe him an honest day's work. And uh, it's sad to see that that, uh, boy, the, that work ethic, of course you have the famous Protestant work ethic, that that ethic is evaporating amongst the younger generation. And that is tragic. Uh, on the other hand, though, masters, masters have uh, an obligation to treat their employees with dignity, recognizing the image and likeness of God within their employees, recognizing that just because they have been made masters, employers, bosses, that they are not inherently better than those under them, and they uh, should not be tyrannizing people that are under them. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 9, Masters, do the same things to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. Note that, so that term, partiality. Um, God recognizes the image of God within the, uh, the worker, the employee, and so should, therefore, the employer. You're not inherently better than other people. You just happen to have a functional superiority within the hierarchy of the, uh, of the business. Now, the same applies with rulers and subjects. It is the will of God that there be rulers. Again, we uh, last couple sessions we talked about uh, Genesis 9-6 where we find the seed or germ of human government being planted, the idea that the sword would be placed in the hand of the ruler uh, to punish criminals. Ultimately, earthly governments are to be about protecting their citizens. That's their number one uh, mission. That's why the king bears a sword. Read Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. It is the will of God that we be in submission to the ruler of the state. Also consult uh, 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14. Um, it is King Solomon, who himself was a, slave, uh, a ruler, observes in uh, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, 9, 10 that it's not... Uh, it is not fitting for a, uh, excuse me, Proverbs 19.10, that it is not uh, fitting for a, a prince to bow to a slave. Uh, and yet, and yet, kings are not called to despotism. You know, there's old, an old saying, um, even a cat can look at a king. That means <laughs> even the, the humblest person has certain rights, has a certain dignity attached to him. Of course, in a lot of these uh, uh, regimes coming out of the Orient, a lot of these uh, monarchies where the kings were treated like gods, um, it was, sometimes it was forbidden for the commoner to look upon the king, you know, get face down in the dirt when the king passes by. It's not how it should be. Um, Proverbs 29, 2 reminds us that when the righteous increase, the people are glad. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. Again, again, King Solomon himself, uh, a splendid oriental despot, uh, nonetheless, he himself, uh, in the spirit, recognizes this, that uh, the king should not be a tyrant. Um, also, Proverbs 28, 15, again, coming from the pen of, of King Solomon. Um, the, uh, like a roaring lion and a rushing bear is a wicked ruler over a poor people. Notice that a wicked ruler, a tyrant, a base tyrant is compared to a wild animal. So, uh, while kings, yes, have been granted authority, and while it is unseemly when his subjects do not obey him, nonetheless, the ruler has an obligation before God to recognize the image and likeness of God within uh, his subjects. Um, there is an exception, of course, to that, and that is if the ruler demands that the, uh, the subject violate conscience, if the ruler de uh, demands that the person uh, uh, set aside the will of God, 
and uh, follow the prince in sin, the, uh, the subject has the obligation to disobey the ruler and serve the living God. You know how our Lord uh, Jesus expressed this in, in Matthew uh, chapter 22, that we are to render to Caesar those things that legitimately are Caesar's, but let render unto God those things that uh, are God's. Um, also, the distinction between men and women. Of course, a created difference, as we just uh, said. Um, there is a great difference between men and women, and it's a wonderful difference. Uh, as the French say, vive la différence. Um, men, uh, women were create, men and women are to be mutual helpers to one another. Uh, Eve was created to be Adam's helpmate, to be at his side, created from his side to be at his side. And, uh, of course, uh, there is a hierarchy within the home. Um, we think about Ephesians 5, uh, where Paul speaks extensively about the nature of the Christian home, how it's to be, uh, how it is to reflect the higher reality of the relationship of Christ and his church, his church being his bride. Human marriage is a type of that greater reality. And the wives are called upon to submit to their husbands as to the Lord, Ephesians 5, and 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. So there is this idea that wives are to be in subjection, that the husband does have a primacy within the home. Again, uh, Colossians 3, 18 Paul writes, wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Or 1 Corinthians 11, 3, um, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the woman is, uh, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. So you see, uh, Paul there is comparing the relationship between the man and the woman to the inter-Trinitarian relationship, the idea of the, the functional differences. Again, we're talking about the economic trinity, that the Father is the head over Christ in terms of uh, uh, subordination with regard to the doctrine of redemption. But nonetheless, inherently, Christ, uh, the Son, is co-equal with the Father. And the same is true in the human home, that, uh, yes, the man has been given a functional uh, uh, distinction, that he, is, he has primacy, functional primacy, but that doesn't mean he's better, inherently more spiritual, inherently a higher uh, rank of human being by, in terms of his nature than his wife is. No. A thousand times no. They are co-equal in terms of they both bear the, the divine image. And uh, husbands, by the way, if only they would take seriously the admonition that God has for them. Husbands, this is verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Gave himself up for her. You know, uh, the, the idea that the husband, while he is the head, it's, uh, he is to be the head in the same way that Christ is the head. Uh, Christ uh, came as one who was a servant. You know, that was, uh, that, it was a servant leadership. And Christ sacrificially gave his all for his beloved. Husbands who are tyrants over their wife aren't doing that, are they? They're abusers. They're fools. Um, that's not what a husband's called to when he's been, been given primacy. And it makes it very difficult for the woman, of course, in a relationship when the husband is uh, misusing uh, his primacy in the home, uh, abusing it, and it makes it very, uh, very difficult for, for her to be in uh, submission. But nonetheless, 1 Peter 3.1 offers such suffering wives this word of hope. He says... Uh, in the same way, you wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, that they may be won without a word and by the conduct of their wives. You know, the Christian woman's godly 
humble conduct sometimes can go a lot farther than just uh, responding in like kind to the husband and being equally abusive. A solid testimony, you know, a soft word, uh, does much uh, in terms of uh, um, healing a broken situation. Um, also, we see the complementarian roles within the church. Um, we, uh, we have men and women, uh, again, are co-equal in terms of uh, their inherent worth and their inherent dignity and their spiritual capacity. Nonetheless, there are differing roles within, for each within the church. This is called complementarianism, and it's much under assault. You know, lately you've seen people like Beth Moore causing a lot of problems within the church. Uh, she left the uh, Southern Baptist uh, Church after uh, uh, Southern Baptist Convention after bad-mouthing one of the greatest men in their convention, Dr. Albert Muller. By the way, I strongly encourage you to study Dr. Muller's materials, one of the great, great men of our era. But um, the fact is, men and women do have differing roles, functional uh, distinctions within the church. Think about 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 through 13. Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first formed, and then Eve. You know, he's appealing to the original created order. Uh, you know, he's talking about, really, I, uh, I believe, the pastorate here. Um, we know that a lot of well-meaning women uh, have gone that route, but the fact is, I, I think God's word is very clear. The pastor is supposed to be a man. That's how God has willed it. And again, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, the women are to keep silent in the churches for they're not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. You know, the idea that the, the pastor, the, the, a woman should be standing in, head, in headship uh, in this way, in this dramatic way, is serving as a pastor and taking the pulpit, uh, that is not within the will or plan of God. Um, the pastor of the church is to be a man. Now, women have their role in the church, and it's not just baking brownies, but uh, they have their assigned roles uh, in God's economy, and so do men. The, uh, the matter of uh, parent and child. Again, children are not inherently inferior to their parents, they, uh, but uh, then nonetheless they are to be subject to their parents, obedient to their parents. Of course, that goes back to the law of Moses, the fifth of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. But in Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4, uh, Paul again takes up this matter. The children are to be in submission. Uh, they're not over their parents, although in reality, let's face it, a lot of children do rule the roost at home much to their destruction and uh, much to the uh, destruction of their parents, too. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the tragedies of modern life. The brat rules the roost. However, um, parents, likewise, are not to be tyrants, just as husbands are not to be tyrants. They are admonished to raise their children in a milieu that is loving and godly. Um, abusing a child, Paul warns, warns can create wrath in the heart of that child. How many children grow up in a state of resentment because they had unfit parents that continually abused them? And, you know, you, if you it's kind of put it in uh, these kind of allegorical terms. Uh, you, be, you can take a little puppy, an innocent little puppy, and beat that little puppy every day. Eventually, what are you going to have? you're going to have a really mean, vicious, junkyard dog on your hands. A killer. And that's one of the reasons that some children end up so warped. Um, 
You also have these national distinctions, and there are national distinctions. In fact, even in the, if you look at Revelation chapter 20, uh, even during the millennium, there will be national distinctions. And then if you look at 20, Revelation 21 and 22, that even deals with the eternal state, apparently these national distinctions, uh, what, these ethno, ethnic distinctions, will be part of the eternal state. It will carry that identity with us even throughout eternity. And you know, the Lord God created all races and all nations, and he assigned them their own national boundaries. Now this Paul mentions that in Acts chapter 17, verse, uh, verse 26. Uh, every nation and ethnos, it has its own history, its own culture, its own language. Of course, the languages originally came out of the dispersion at the Tower of Babel when the nation, when uh, the, the survivors of the flood refused to obey God and fill the earth, refill the earth. God confused their languages and dispersed them and assigned them to various national boundaries. And, uh, you know, the it's interesting, it is true that, uh, that God has dealt more graciously with some, some nations than others. And no one can argue with that because God's grace, uh, no one is worthy of God's grace. If God chooses to be gracious, that's his business. Uh, if he chooses to be particular in terms of his grace, that is, be gracious to one person but not gracious to another, that's, uh, that's, that's God's business. Uh, no one can argue with it because the only thing any of us er have earned or deserved is uh, eternal destruction. Let's remember this. Grace is God's unmerited favor uh, to, uh, to uh, whoever he chooses to express this favor towards. It's his unmerited favor towards the unworthy. The, uh, the fact is uh, some nations have been chosen. Um, the nation of Israel was chosen by God. But God reminds them in Deuteronomy 9.4 that they were not chosen because they're better than any other people. He, he tells them, you are a stiff-necked people. And of course, their whole history proves that. Continually rebellious, even though God sent them prophets. They were not inherently superior. They were just chosen. God has had his own mysterious purposes in choosing the sons of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob but that doesn't mean they're inherently better than other people. You see that? Some nations have been dealt with more graciously than others. They've been, they've been allowed to have the light of the gospel. Others have remained in darkness for centuries. I can't explain that, why one nation has been dealt, dealt with more graciously than another. I just I accept it as part of the divine plan. Um, some, uh, some nations, of course, because they have been under the light of the gospel, have been blessed, of course, through this spiritual heritage that they have more than others. Um, Psalm 33, verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Um, you know, we think about our own country, uh, the, the great blessings that have been shed upon our nation. And again, God has been gracious. It's not been something that we have deserved. Uh, but uh, we see uh, God uh, kind of an unfolding plan. I think it is proper to speak of America as a, uh, uh, shall we say, a, uh, uh, well, the term that's often used is uh, uh, an exceptional nation, again, not because we're inherently superior to other nations, but because we have this spiritual heritage which has allowed us, uh, really has shaped our democratic republic, and uh, America has been used providentially in these last days for much good in advancing uh, the Lord's kingdom, sending out missionaries throughout the world like no other nation has done so, at least not to the extent that America has done so, um, showing what the fruits of uh, uh, a constitutional heritage that's derived out of the word of God, what it can mean in the life of a people, uh, a testimony to the other nations. 
Uh, and so in this sense, America has been exceptional, and the results have been exceptional. Few nations have enjoyed the freedom of conscience that this nation has enjoyed. Um, but having said all of that, that there are distinctions and differences bet uh, between nations, and that some nations are more blessed than others, and some nations have been dealt with more graciously than others, in the end, that is not to be translated into the idea that some people are inherently better than others. The Jews were reminded, the ancient Hebrews, I should say, were reminded in the days of Moses that they were not chosen because they were better. Divine election, by the way, is always unconditional. Uh, yes, we are Calvinists. And uh, it, is un it's, it wasn't because the, the Hebrews were better, either morally or else, or any other terms of resource. Moses reminds them, you weren't chosen because you were stronger or more populous than other nations. In fact, you were the least of nations. God chose you. He chose to love you. Why? Because he chose to love you. And we leave it at that. Okay? The, we... we it wasn't based upon merit that the Hebrews were chosen. By the way, that's, in ter that's true in terms of the doctrinal election of individuals uh, unto salvation. No one is chosen because they're inherently better or, or that God foresees faith in your heart. That's the Arminian theory of election. Now, uh, God chose us because he chose us, and we leave it at that. And uh, also... When we, uh, we think about our own uh, country, the United States, we should not be chauvinistic in terms of this idea that we, we Americans, we're better than other people. Yes, we've experienced spiritual blessing, but it's not, we're not better than other people inherently. We're not racially superior to other nations, ethnically superior to other nations. We're sinners. Uh, the doctor, doctrine of total depravity and original sin applies to us the same as it does to any other nation. America may be an exceptional nation in terms of what God has chosen to do through America and God guiding America's history and God protecting America so that it could do certain things so that it could play a certain role. But let us not make the mistake of thinking that we're inherently better. By nature, we were conceived in sin, just like any other group of people. By nature, we thrive on God's grace. By nature, we're sinners, and we should not think of ourselves arrogantly as being better than other people. Well, I'm going to have to uh, continue with this matter of partiality next week. We're just, uh, this week we uh, spent most of our time talking about uh, the distinctions between men, that yes, there are legitimate distinctions, and yes, there are certain, uh, some of these are by divine design. Um, some of these distinctions, though, have been uh, corrupted by uh, uh, by sin, leading to tyranny, one group tyrannizing another group, uh, or claiming it's superior to another group. There are dis legitimate distinctions, but we should not think that anyone is inherently superior. And that's where partiality comes in. Next week I want to talk about the real expressions of partiality that we see, especially in the church. Sadly, we see a lot of this even in the church, and that's the saddest thing of all, which should be the last place that you see these things. So I'm going to pick up on that theme next week, and we hope that, uh, we hope that uh, uh, there will be a, an impact in terms of uh, what it is that we deem as proper within our own communities. Well, until next time, uh, friends, this is Pastor Terry Reese, and uh, indeed, may the Lord be with you.